Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path, and I'm your host, Mike Allen. Well, I've never heard them, but those who have say they sound like thunder, very loud thunder. The noises, usually described as fearful, dreadful, even eerie. Well, they're called the Moodus noises. They're named after the village in East Haddam, where they've been heard literally for centuries. There are age-old stories, legends, and good old folklore attached to these noises, and they are truly mysterious head-scratchers. Well, our guest today is Professor Stephen Gencarella. He's a communications professor at the University of Massachusetts who lives in Lyme, Connecticut, which is just one town away from where those noises originate. Steve specializes in the field of folklore in a very serious way. He's even got a Ph.D. in it. And he's going to be along in a minute to help us get to the bottom of the moodest noises and wait until you hear what he has to say. This week's trivia question, if you were a father and you had a son, well, the last place you'd want him to be is in jail. Well, which one of our country's founding fathers saw his son go to jail right here in Connecticut? Stick around after the main program for the answer because then you'll know the topic for next week's show. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. When people need the best quality health care, there's a reason they turn to Yale New Haven Health. In 1826, Yale New Haven Hospital became Connecticut's very first hospital. They were the first hospital in the U.S. to use chemotherapy. Yale New Haven was the first to introduce insulin pumps for diabetic patients. And they introduced the world's first intensive care unit for newborns. For more information about Yale New Haven Health, visit YNHHS.org. That's YNHHS.org. The Moodus Noises. Over the centuries, many have heard them, and many a story has grown around them. Well, let's start off by explaining Moodus. It's a small village within the larger town of East Haddam, Connecticut. It's on the east side of the Connecticut River, about 17 miles inland from Long Island Sound. In the 1800s, Moodus was even a bustling mill town. But in the 1960s, officials had a vision for it involving urban renewal. They tore down much of the old village of Moodus, and then unfortunately that project went dormant. Well, the village consists of a relatively small number of structures today, and nature has reclaimed much of what had been built back in the day. Now, the first time that we're aware of that somebody made formal note of the Moodus noises was back in 1702. That's a little more than 300 years ago. So what's behind these mysterious noises, many of which seem to be based in Macamudus State Park? And what does that word Macamudus mean, and why is it associated with the noises? Well, there are a lot of rumors, legends, and folklore surrounding these noises, and that's why I'm particularly pleased to have a professional folklorist on the show today, University of Massachusetts communications professor Stephen Jancarella, who has graciously allowed me to call him Steve. Steve, let's start off asking you what I think is an important question for the audience to understand. What is a folklorist? What is it that you actually do? <laughs> A professional folklorist, I mean, I have a PhD in it, and we are trained to look at the role of tradition in human life and communities. We'll look at traditions, particularly narrative traditions, like legends and myths, rumors, folk tales and fairy tales that people pass on from generation to generation. We look at things like celebrations, holidays, parades, and really all of the lore that helps people understand who they are as a folk. Let's turn back that clock. And Native Americans are there. And tell me what they were doing living in that area. What, what do we know about that? The area itself, from the archaeological record, seems to suggest that there have been indigenous people at least visiting the area and on seasonal hunting visits. We could be talking about ten, you know, ten thousand years potentially, but this site was even before the Europeans arrived, was certainly an important site to the indigenous people in the region. 
the reason we know this, of course, is when you go back to the original deeds, that is, when the indigenous people are signing off the land, that word is being used in the late 1600s. It appears on the deeds, Makamudas. We know that the peoples here, that is, the indigenous people, would have been dealing with the same acoustic noises that uh, later colonists, later white people uh, would encounter. What did Makamudas mean in the uh, language of the Native Americans? It often is translated, particularly in tourist guides, as the place of noises. It really does mean the place of bad noises. We know this because that maka is Algonquian for bad. And one of the reasons we know this is that, for example, when the Lord's Prayer was translated into various Algonquian dialects, deliver us from evil, the evil is the word machet. For the indigenous people in the area, you could call it the place of bad noises in the same way that you could have when thunder comes, it could be a bad thing if you're going to be caught out in a storm or in a dangerous location. In the same way we could think of bad smells or bad timing or things that are unfortunate, things that are not helpful or not beneficial. But we wouldn't want to jump to moralizing and thinking that that implied evil noises, rather a place of something foreboding, problematic. Maybe supernaturally foreboding is happening here that's a little bit beyond human comprehension, a little bit beyond human understanding. Now, it's interesting that you make this distinction and talk about the clash of the religions because this is where things start to get off on a bad foot. As the white settlers come in, uh, it's the early 1700s, and I think it was even the Reverend uh, Stephen Hosmer heard one of these noises, and he, he described it, I believe, as fearful and dreadful. I mean, he was obviously shaken by this, but he turns around and blames it on the Native American gods, correct? The answer is yes, with the caveat that Hosmer himself, basically a Puritan thinker, to those Puritans, unusual noises, particularly unusual noises that have a kind of inexplicable origin, would have, for them, more likely been assigned to the Christian God. That is, the Christian God often did things from their perspective to remind people of his power and remind them to be righteous. He writes a letter to a fellow pastor in Boston and is describing these. And from what we can tell, they were, the noises were very frequent at that time. That is, people were hearing them more than they hear them in our contemporary period. Hosmer describes asking someone who had spoken to an indigenous person, that indigenous person purportedly said that his God was angry that the Christian God had come. And so we get immediately right into this issue of a cultural clash. If we believe Hosmer, right, there's an indigenous person who is saying that the noises are caused by my God being angry that your God is here. Of course, the problem with that is it, it is biased. It's, we don't have the indigenous person's voice. We don't even have his or her or their name. We have Hosmer himself, who is motivated by his own understandings. And of course, this is happening at a time when, to be blunt, white colonists are looking for reasons to take the land from indigenous people. When Hosmer himself describes the area, He describes it as the place of extraordinary Indian powwows, that it was a place where the Indians drove a prodigious trade of worshiping the devil. Even Hosmer, who might have been a far more sympathetic person to indigenous people than most colonists, he still saw anything that they did as worship of the devil from there. So now, we've already been talking for a while, and we're just scratching the surface on the beginning of this story. There's a lot of chapters here to talk about. And we're going to start off talking about a very interesting character named Dr. Steele. And I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to let you tell the story. But I will say this. He picked up something called a carbuncle. And I'm sure I'm not the only person who has no idea what a carbuncle is is or was, 
So I'm going to turn that over to you. Can you please enlighten us on what a carbuncle is and Dr. Steele? In 1790, and a specific newspaper in New London, And it's a story of a man by the name of Steele, usually a Dr. Steele, who comes from Europe, almost always England, or at least the British Isles, attracted by stories themselves of the noises. And so the idea is that the noises have crossed the pond, they've gone across the Atlantic. And an erudite man in, let's just go with England, hears of them and comes to investigate. He's a man of some unusual information, unusual knowledge, and he comes from the old world to the new world right here in our beloved East Haddam to search for what he thinks is the source of the noises themselves. He investigates the area around, in the earliest versions, the Salmon River. The the Salmon and the Moodus River meet, and where they meet, there's a sugar loaf hill currently called Mount Tom. In the earliest stories, Steele goes off from the village of East Haddam, and he discovers in the banks of the Salmon River carbuncles. In the old meaning of the term, they are literally stones that grow in size, and that also have, in this case, a kind of magical component, mystical component to them. So, Through his erudition, he locates the place to dig for this unusual treasure in the banks of the Salmon River, and therein finds at least one, depending on the storyteller, but at least one and sometimes a couple of growing, glowing stones, these carbuncles, that are of such immense value one could not put a limit on how important they are. He takes them but he relieves the earth of what is kind of a, the best way to use it is a pregnancy, that the idea is that the earth is moaning, that Moodus is moaning because it has in its womb, in its belly, I don't, I don't know where we want to locate it, but these carbuncles that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and when steel removes them, the noises then cease and go away. He will warn them that he also saw tiny seedlings, tiny stones that maybe flickered with that little eerie mystical glow. And so he assured them that the noises would someday return when those carbuncles grew to such a size as to begin to once again put pressure on and irritate the earth and the banks by the river. For generations, when Steele's name is spelled, it is usually a beautifully anglicized S-T-E-E-L or S-T-E-E-L-E. And when I went digging to the original story itself in the Connecticut Gazette of 1790, there's a remarkable clue to what we're dealing with, because his name is not Steele in either of those forms, but it's Steele, S T E. A-L, as in somebody who steals something and steals away. And that's when the light bulb went off in my head as a folklorist. We're dealing with an international folk story. We're dealing with the story that actually goes back to, we have examples from the Roman times and plentiful examples in medieval Europe of an erudite man who goes to a river, right, and finds often a treasure underneath or goes into a mountain near a river. So this is an ancient folk tale that was eventually brought here and localized to our area. It also puts you on the path of, wait a minute, who's telling these stories? They're very often sailors, and one of the places that they were especially popular, that is in Ireland. And in fact, when you dig into certain parts of Irish folklore, it turns out there's a creature there that's called a carbuncle that itself is a kind of river water monster that sheds gems. And so I think what we're seeing is the presence of certainly European sailors, and my guess would be potentially even Irish sailors, 
coming to the area. We know that East Haddam had an Irish population much before the potato famine led so many immigrants here. I know we're seeing the movement of a folk tale being localized, and I think what we're seeing is evidence of the Irish coming to this area and bringing and adapting stories from the homeland to fit here, both to help make sense of what they were experiencing, the noises, and to tie them to the traditions of back home. Let's move, I guess, 30, 40 years forward into the early 1800s, and there is this story written, The Human Sacrifice, by John Greenleaf Whittier. This really, I suppose, helped to turn probably was already a negative opinion among settlers of Native Americans. This certainly didn't help. Tell us that story. We may remember him as kind of one of the most important American poets of the 1800s. He was from the Haverhill, Massachusetts area, but he moved to Hartford. And while he was here, became attracted to the folklore of Connecticut. He also became particularly attracted to the poetry of John Gardner Calkins Brainerd, And Brainerd did a great service to us in that he captured and put into poetry many of the folk tales and the legends that were circulating in southeastern Connecticut in his day in the early 1800s. Whittier, attracted by these stories, then began to experiment himself. And unfortunately, in his first real attempt, a volume called The Legends of New England, he published a story called The Human Sacrifice. He later actually in his life was so embarrassed by the entire book that he refused its republication. And one of the things that embarrassed him is the depiction of indigenous people. But nevertheless, The Human Sacrifice is an important turning point. It's the story of indigenous people in a nefarious, cultish behavior of sacrificing a human being, in this case, a captured colonial young woman. In Whittier's story, as she is about to be sacrificed, the virgin pure young girl, she prays and the Christian God sends the moodest noises, chasing the indigenous people away then and and arguably forever. It's a continuation of a justification for why indigenous people should leave and why it's okay for white colonists to occupy the area. That's the first time we see the name of this quote-unquote angry Indian god. And the name that Whittier gives to him is Habamak. From that point on, Habamak is associated with the Moodist noises. I mean, literally to this day, you can find, you know, tour guides that will say, beware if you go to Mount Tom, for it is the abode of Habamak. The problem with it is that he's neither good nor evil. That is, he's the figure one appeals to, to cure disease and also the one to cause disease upon one's enemies. He is a powerful being associated with death, but also where life and death interact. He's a figure of nightmares, but he's also a figure of incredible spiritual importance. So Habamak is not really one traditionally associated with eerie noises. But Habamak got anchored here because of the popularity of Whittier as a writer. And what Whittier was doing was following a tradition among many white writers in the 1800s, where instead of doing due diligence and giving the actual names for indigenous supernatural beings, they all just went with Habamak. They kind of made him the universal angry or evil quote-unquote Indian god. Now, I'm going to ask you to explain the difference between Mount Tom and Cave of the Winds, because both in time have been sort of pointed at as the source of the noises. Sure. The beauty is they are about a half mile from one another. Mount Tom is a sugarloaf hill that is perched where the Moodis and the Salmon Rivers meet before they empty into the Connecticut River. Basically, across the street from what today is Macamudis State Park, there is a campground there 
and on the ledges above that campground is a cave. This is a genuine cave that stretches down at least 40, 45, maybe even 48 feet. It was called and christened the Cave of Winds in the 1800s. It is plausible that when the noises happened, there have been some speculation that the noises may have been amplified through this cave structure. Now, how does this factor into one of the stories that came out in uh, also the late 1800s, 1887, in the New York City-based newspaper, The Sun? I think the best way to describe it, I think the term is still relevant, that is, it's yellow journalism. The Sun was in competition with other New York papers. We had people who were willing to go with any story, you know, facts be damned. The Sun was incredibly experienced at doing so, and it was clearly read in and around Connecticut. So they began to just run with the idea that something unusual was happening around the Moodis area. The Moodis corresponded, I wish we could find out who it was, began to speculate, began to tell tales of a cave. In this cave, it turns out that this is the place where our good old friend, Dr. Steele, right, actually discovers the carbuncle. And so what we see is a movement within, you know, roughly 100 years of this international folktale set at the Salmon River, now being moved to a cave, and that cave's location even moves because although the cave is not on Mount Tom, the writers just saw fit to kind of move it to Mount Tom. But they did one better. Not only does Steele discover the carbuncle now in a cavern under Mount Tom, he's captured by witches who put him on trial. Some witches wish to punish him for the theft of the carbuncle. Others see him as a more sympathetic figure, perhaps, you know, a, a human who didn't know better and want to release him. And so we have a courtroom drama, and I can do one better. Because the judge is called the king of the Makamodi, that is, the king of the witches himself, is the person who oversees this original steel legend and eventually decides to acquit Steele of the crime, to even give him the carbuncle, because as king of the witches, he could create, he says in the tale, I can create another one whenever I want to, I can create another carbuncle, no problem. So as stories were told after, they continued the idea that Mount Tom has caverns underneath. They continued the idea even that Mount Tom might be hollow, and they continued the idea that witches were underneath Mount Tom, were in those caverns, doing their nefarious activities. Now comes the part that makes me the saddest. It's like watching a Harry Potter movie, and then realizing you got to go back to mundane life and eat dinner. Now we're going to talk about what really is causing these noises. And it's not nearly as spectacular as what you've just laid out. And I, I'm sorry to let everybody down, but we've got to do this now. Who, what, where, we know, and let's just do the spoiler alert now. These are earthquakes that are causing these noises. And what do we know about this seismic activity? You've got it. They are indeed. We have spoiled this, although I'm delighted we waited. <laughs> they are earthquakes that generally are on the low end of the Richter scale. That is, for the most part, you know, in the one to two range. Historically, we have had some real dramatic eruptions in the hundreds of years that people have been aware of them, even as earthquakes. There have been a few occasions when they've bumped up higher. But they're also shallow. And so, in other words, if you are close to the epicenter, and by the way, the epicenter isn't even in the village of Moodis, nor at Macamuda State Park. The village of Leesville will feel the ground shake. But most people don't feel the ground shaking. And the reason is because you have these low on the Richter scale earthquakes that are shallow. And so the force goes into the air rather than shake the ground. And that's what causes these kinds of thunderous noises, the eerie noises, the bad noises, to go back to Machimudis, 
are the result of atmospheric pressures that are the result of these shallow, low on the Richter scale earthquakes. The mystery of what they are is really no mystery. And the beauty, I think, though, is even today with people aware of what they are, I can't tell you how many times I talk to people who feel that they've missed out because they haven't heard them. Tourists who go for a hike at Makamuda State Park, right? People who visit the area and, and wish they could experience it. How often do you think people, you know, want to experience an earthquake? But here in this belovedly interesting part of the world, uh, we do feel, you know, again, that you've, your life is not complete if you haven't heard them or lived through them. Well, back in 1791, Connecticut experienced what's been termed its worst earthquake in recorded history. Today, they estimate it would have been a 4.5 or 5.0 on the Richter scale. They know there were two successive shakes, the first more powerful than the second. They know there was a fissure in the ground that measured more than 10 yards wide. And they also know that stone walls and rock chimneys were destroyed. And by the way, a boat captain in Clinton said he saw fish jump out of the water all around him. Well, that wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. I want to thank our guest for today's program, Professor Stephen Jencarella, Professor of Communications and Folklore at the University of Massachusetts, who lives in the town of Lyme, Connecticut, just next door to those eerie noises in Moodis. The answer to this week's trivia question, the question was, if you're a father and you have a son, the last place you want to see him is in jail. And which of our country's founding fathers saw his son go to jail? Right here in Connecticut. Well, the answer is the founding father was Ben Franklin. Next week on Amazing Tales CT, it was Ben's son, William Franklin, who was jailed for many months in the 1700s here in Connecticut. We'll tell you why he was jailed and the horrible conditions he endured in solitary confinement. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and please stay healthy. (laughs) 